do this. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. So um, I'd like to first acknowledge um, and thank the uh, traditional welcome that we've received this morning, the sharing of knowledge we've received today. Um, I'm very grateful for that. As I'm also grateful for the knowledge sharing and experience and support that we receive in our work by survivors of sexual abuse, by the people who are here in this room, because you are the people who help us to do good work and also support our learning and the, the kind of work we do. So thank you very much to everybody in this room. Please give yourself a round of applause. In speaking now, I'm aware there's so much that's already been said, and some of our stuff kind of covers that, so we're going to try and speak to that but not repeat it over and over again. Uh, but also I'm aware that on this wall is a, a document of information, a, a mass amount of information that was provided by survivors yesterday. This is of absolute currency. Often research is quite old. This is the document I invite you to be reading throughout this week, and hopefully then I know this will be shared by Ken, and thank you for the invite, Ken, but I think this is where we should also be looking when you're even listening to some of the things that we say. So thank you for that. Now, we're going to, um, over the next uh, few minutes, we have a couple of videos, so we're going to break it up a bit for you guys. Um, this, this piece here is Patrick's going to speak to that first bit about our knowledge into action uh, and taking some of that and reviewing some of the information we really do know now about working with men or men's experiences. And then I might look at about the work in progress about that service delivery and the challenges we face in kind of creating services and improving responses, which is not just about services. So we'll, we'll talk to that as well. So I'll hand you over to Patrick. So thanks, Gary. Um, to set that we're, we're a global conference, an international conference, and this issue of male survivors of child sexual abuse has both a local context. We can see one, of, one quote from uh, one man we've already heard from today, a uh, call for inquiry here. But we've also seen it at a global level, at a UN level, the call for, for uh, not only ending violence, and sexual violence against children, but also to look at ourselves in that process. Um, on Wednesday, we'll be talking more about institutional responses to child sexual abuse, but um, it's important to say in this context that um, in Australia, we're at a real crossroads as we begin closing the uh, Royal Commission, that we need to move what we've learnt into action. And, um, and that's a critical time, so there's some key learning there. Um, we've seen today that there's um, a particular um, focus on knowledge. We just in the last presentation, three presentations showed that we, we do know a lot. That's not to say we shouldn't be going on seeking knowledge about this issue, but we can uh, look at how we disseminate that knowledge, how we can learn from that knowledge in, in that journey. And there's a variety of knowledges. They shouldn't be competing with each other. They should be working together. Sorry? The slide's not changing. Oh, what's that man? Sorry. Well, I'll give you a chance to read the quote from Ken. I'll, I'll read one out. Oh, I can't read it now. Thank you. Thank you. So that, those are the two quotes I was referring to. First of all, Ken referring to the responsibility of the state and the government here, and then the UN calling for greater action and responsibility both within countries, institutions and families. Um, we'll move to the next slide. This is a local and global issue Um, child, child protection responses across the world need to be seen in the context of the responses for male survivors. 
And moreover, the quality of the response for male survivors does have an impact on today's protection of young men and boys. Creating a protective environment for survivors creates a protective environment for today's generation of children. Moreover, we can see that there's some challenges internationally. Many uh, in the social development context, in low and middle income countries, child protection responses are often institutionalisation. And we know from the Royal Commission we've had in Australia and right around the world, we know that institutions can often be a very unsafe place for children. So how do we move that from the Western world, the privileged world, to uh, the social development world? We have lots of international agreements in the context for both survivors and children. But matching that up to compliance is an ongoing uh, challenge. There's different legislative frameworks, particular challenges where, for example, um, there's discrimination against non-heterosexual uh, practices. We have diverse cultural and religious meaning about uh, what sexual violence might mean and the responses. There's clear power imbalances. We also need to think about vul vulnerabilities for, for boys and men. For example, children are often detained uh, without court hearings, uh, often uh, deprived of their liberty, and we know that adds to their vulnerability. We've seen this already. So we want... Oh, it didn't change. Uh, is it? Has it changed no, now? No, I think it's changed. Yes, knowledge into action. That's knowledge right, into it? action. No. Um, it is evident from um, what we know that more research can be done. Our challenge is to transfer knowledge into action. Now we'll check if it changes now. No, it's still not moving, sorry. You're right, Alistair, it wasn't. We won't keep you later if it doesn't change, all right? <laughs> Just so everybody knows. You can breathe. Yeah, okay? we can breathe. We'll find a way around that. We can use that one. Can we move from that one? <clears throat> just, while, just while we're talking, I, w I just want to um, uh, pick up on a, a couple of points here from this slide. We're back in business. Hopefully it'll move this time. Um, we know that the problem is significant, that the, the significant gaps in knowledge and skills also relate to the mainstream services. Men don't go to a specialist service. They go to their GP, they go to the local community centre, they talk to their mum, they talk to their dad, they talk to their friends. And to students, often many of them weren't born um, uh, before 1975, but I think a lot of you might qualify. Um, there was one case predicted per, per million. Now we can say something about that, that it's much more like one in six, and we know that it's probably uh, underreported even at those statistics. We know that uh, males are at greater risk in some contexts. We know that more males are vulnerable to uh, female perpetrators of child sexual abuse. Men's experiences are diverse, and hence our responses need to be diverse. And whilst we've had a focus on therapy, we also need to think that there's other ways of responding that aren't about seeing a counsellor, around how men access information in a digital age, how men might respond in alternative ways to responding to trauma. So there's no prescribed way of responding, but we know some things we saw today about the sorts of events that may influence the impact. That might be the age, it might be how, how often the abuse happened, but there's no rule for this. 
What we do know is that a complex trauma-informed response can cope with these differences. We've seen already, I'm not going to go into detail here, of common effects, some of the presentations have picked up. But one important thing to pick up here is the effects can be diverse and experienced at different stages in the life course. Many survivors can point to lots of success. They're travelling well for a period and something might just happen. That, mean that means that the journey is at that little bit harder for that point in time. And that's why when we're thinking about an inquiry, we're thinking about responses, we need to take a life course approach. Can we talk to that? Yeah. Um, just in relation to, because we've seen PTSD bandied around, and we understand that's in DSM-5 for those who do that kind of technical language. Um, but the complex trauma model is one that's kind of been advocated and it probably will be in what's called ICD-11, which is the international um, categorization. But what we know is complex trauma better fits the experience of childhood sexual abuse and sexual assault than PTSD. Um, because the reality is that often these are incidents that can go on for a period of time, can significantly compromise the child's well-being, and at a particularly a significant de developmental stage of the child's growth. What we know around kind of human growth, etc., is that you don't get this sense of self really until you're in your late teens and like early 20s. That's when you come to identify yourself and see yourself where you fit in the world as, as an adult operating in that space. If childhood sexual abuse has occurred to you, then you can't separate out that sense of self from this experience of childhood sexual abuse because it's already happened. It's already influencing your life and your sense of self. There is no place to go back to this sense of self before the abuse when abuse has happened at these developmental stages. So we need to be aware that sense of self can be significantly compromised that. That doesn't mean we can't live a good life around this, but it's not a simple, you know, we'll use a PTSD model and we'll just reduce your affect and difficulties and, and kind of get on so that you can get on in the world. No, this is about who I am in the world and we need to be aware of that when we're doing the work with people in this area. One effect that I think as a public health issue in terms of a response we need to think very carefully about is suicidality for men. Now, we did some, there's some research that shows, and this can inform responses, that there are some drivers of, of suicidal ideation. And some of these relate to some of the previous work that, that people have highlighted in presentations. But they're about some of the, the worst extremes of masculinity. That where we adhere, adhere to much more the extremes of how to measure up as a man, this can be predictive of a worse outcome, can be damaging. And you can see there some of those things about acting, acting isolated in a, in a way that you feel alone, acting violently and aggressively. Some of the men we've worked with say things like, I get in first before anyone can hurt me now. Having a sense of hope has been an important theme today, and that's important in terms of the message that men have. I'll just get Gary to comment on so, that. And I wanted to comment on this slide. This is a 2011 slide. It's one of the things that helped stimulate the Royal Commission. And you see that figure there of 26 men had committed suicide in one area in Ballarat in Northern Victoria. Um, and this was in relation to the offending of two priests at two schools. So this is one group, one community. That figure is actually inaccurate. We now know that 40 men from that community have committed suicide as a result of the sexual abuse and sexual assault uh, uh, by these priests when they were children. At the Royal Commission, one of the, the men presenting evidence held a picture of his first year at school, a school photo of which six of the boys were no longer there because they had committed suicide. This is a serious health issue. And we need to understand that the risk of suicide for men around sexual abuse is, is very... And often it's not predictive of having depression. You could do a depression test. Are they depressed? Well, no, on the measurement, they're not depressed. But that sense of shame, that sense of not just I was involved in a shameful act, but I am shameful, can mean that I can go from I, I'm not coping to I'm out of here so fast. 
And so our work around this, it gives you, we've got all the information there. So if we can reduce isolation, we can help men to manage their anger and aggression. If we can reduce a sense of self-blame around this, if we can help them manage their anxiety, if we can reduce alcohol and drug use, if we can help them have a more flexible and nuanced ideas of what masculinity is all about, and we can promote hope, we can reduce men's suicide around child sexual abuse. It's not we haven't got the information, we need to start implementing these and drawing on this knowledge. So something that I think is a real challenge in responding is improving how we respond to disclosure. Intuitively, we think maybe telling is a good thing, but the research tells us something different, that often men who have disclosed as boys or later in life often show a severe outcome, and that's because the response was, was not helpful. In some extremes, it was abusive again. And this puts a challenge to us all in the community. But you think about yourself as a boy, and if you've got a, something that's really troubling you, no offence to social workers or psychologists or myself as a so, social worker, but you don't want to go and tell a social worker. You want to tell those close to you, those who you love and trust. But sometimes they're the exact people that aren't equipped to respond appropriately. And this is how we can move forward with this. And delayed disclosure is, is one example. We know these, the Royal Commission, many of the men coming forward, 64% of, of complaints were from men, and many from decades ago, before they first were able to talk about child sexual abuse. And this is so critical in understanding how do we build a response and community that can hear men's stories in, in a way that respects and offers support. So we, we, we've covered some of the things about the barriers to disclosure, but how we impact as men too, how men feel judged by other men, is really critical in how they might make a disclosure. Some of the myths can be challenged here. Some of the vulnerabilities when a when a man dis makes his first disclosure, some of the research shows that they can be extremely more vulnerable to things like suicidality, depression and the effects, because they're feeling vulnerable to being judged. I think taking a life course approach is so critical for services. We don't arrive at this point where people are fixed. Rather, we, we need to understand that people can be triggered or experience distress when they're doing really well. But how they respond to that distress is the thing that matters. Now, we often hear about exposure to media discussions. These can be triggers. We know that particular points in men's life. We over-imprison men, and that can be a particular time when men feel vulnerable and more likely to be triggered. Um, invasive, um, medical procedures can be a trigger for men. And this is important to, to consider in how we educate a wide range of professionals. Men entering residential care, such as aged care facilities later in life, can be a trigger for recalling um, sexual violence. We know some things are helpful, and we know some things aren't. And we covered that. The suppression and the things that lead to silence, internalisation, acceptance that this is your suffering, that you're to blame. But also I think what's really important here is not to think that a therapeutic Western approach is the only way. Often men have recalled in the research that a cathartic sort of retelling of the story can actually be unhelpful because it doesn't feel like it has a practical outcome. Whereas for other men, it might be very helpful. So recounting experiences and the expression of emotion is important, but it does need some practical mechanisms and tools to how, it, how it's then dealt with, what then happens. So productive coping tells us a bit more about service delivery. It tells us about how survivors and professionals can work together in solidarity. 
that the sense of not being alone and working with other survivors can offer men a great deal of strength and solidarity with professionals that are informed by that experience, that there can be practical assistance. As a researcher, I'm always amazed and grateful for men's generosity in telling their stories. But there's a motivation about that. They want it to stop. They want other men to have an easier journey. And that's why they tell. And that's why they volunteer. Um, we also know that developing a sense of hope and knowing that positive reinterpretation, a positive sense out of, out of this experience builds that sense of identity. Not that you can change the past, but you can certainly change the future. So this builds us to thinking about, I'm on the right slide, that's reassuring, um, how we can move this. And Gary's going to move into this, this space now about how we can move knowledge transfer and application. And I think one of the things that I think really challenges us in Australia is we have specialist services that won't see men, for example, when they make a complaint, when they put their hand up for help. There are very limited services around Australia for men who are seeking assistance. We need to see this issue as mainstream, but also part of specialist services for men and women alike. We need to proactively engage with community about research knowledge that makes the response appropriate to where men may first disclose or seek assistance. Hand across to Ooh. Okay. Um, I'll let you read the, the quote. I, and I guess it's just a, a wonderful expression. I heard this man say, he said it to me, I was filming this. And he said, you know, that idea of. Men bumping into services for years. It just rang so true, you know. Like, it's not we haven't engaged with services at different times, but it's like nobody stopped to ask the question about this issue or thought about, if I'm going to ask the question, what happens if he says yes or if he says no, because he's more likely to say no, that I can say to him, look, I know you've said no about this, but just should you, you know, or you might know for a friend, if you did say yes to me, I do have the information available to you, and I know where I can link you into support. So it's not a yes or no am I asking the question, it's about how do I make sure the pathway to support, even if he's not ready to talk at that time, is available. We're always opening up that space. Okay, I'll put a, uh, another slide up here. Uh, so what, we, Patrick, what Patrick's just said, one of the changes, and look, we recognise that in Australia it's not, all, uh, you know, it's not always the best, but it's also, you know, in a sense, we've kind of done a bit of thinking, like New Zealand's done a bit of thinking around this. And yet we can't understand why really our male health, pol health policy has nothing around child sexual abuse of males. We can't understand why our suicide prevention policy really has nothing around child sexual abuse and how to respond to it. We can't understand our, our national prevention sort of, of strategies, which are things like against uh, any violence against women and children, which said in 90, uh, 2010, this strategy, another strategy will need to be developed for working with men who've experienced sexual violence, and nothing's happened in seven years, and there's no sig signal for that to happen. It's almost like we carve out this space, say that this is not for these males, these adult males, which is for children, but not for the adult males, and then we don't follow through. Uh, I recognise that women's services have historically responded to, to really, where we are a debt of gratitude, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, raising the issue, developing the service responses. Um, and I've got this image up here, and I'll read what's at the top right, because some people might not be able to read this, because up until 2003 in Queensland, if you were a child who was sexually abused, and I've got the same one for an adult female as well, and it says, for male patients, alter sketch appropriately. So if you presented for a forensic examination, you were meant to draw the bits on. 
which were male around this. And so what's happened is that the body of the person, the greatest vulnerability, as Chris kind of said, is it's female. So it presents women as female and male as perpetrators. Now, I'm not to I'm fully in agreement that uh, women are highly likely to be sexually abused and sexually assaulted, yeah? and we need to have services around that. And we need to kind of remember around that. And let's not go women have not remembered this. The first ever book, which was around the rape of women, the kind of seminal text, as they say, that made rape the cause celebre for the women's movement was Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will. It set up the whole structure for that. There was a chapter on that about the rape of males in prison. People seem to forget that, in a sense. So that was being named at that time, 1976, 75, 76. And so we're very supportive of that. And the question is now, how do we then start to identify the, the violence and improve those responses to both men and women? And I'm not talking, talking about necessarily women-only services, men-only services. I'm saying about we need to attend to both. Um, and the gender, we've had a chat about gender here. Uh, and I recognize it is a human rights issue, but we live gendered lives. It's a reality how everybody's sitting, what we're wearing here today. And sexual violence is not just a gendered crime, as in women sexually assaulting males. It is writ large throughout the whole experience of sexual violence. If you tear apart each piece of research, who is sexually assaulted and where they're sexually assaulted, the context, is gendered. There's different groups, different places of vulnerabilities and dangers. How they're sexually assaulted, where on their body, their sexual, the type of acts they engage in, are gendered. There's similarities and there's different, distinct differences. How they make sense of that experience as boys and girls is gendered. How they then respond to that experience, whether they're going to go on in their life, is gendered. Where they go, where they might have access to services or not, is gendered. And the types of therapy that would be available to or might be useful for them is gendered. It is writ large. And what we need to recognize is that 80% might be the same for women and women, but there's a slight difference. And we need to develop the more nuanced services which respond to men. Also, not as this kind of static, here's a man, here's a woman, yes, because we miss the trans people in the middle of that one, um, but we need to recognize that all the men in all their diversity, we need to respond to that. We also need to recognize that men, in a sense, come to this experience, and this is difficult with some of this research. We kind of go, oh, men's mental health is wrong, and we've got increased <coughs> um, drug and alcohol problems with men of experience, childhood sexual abuse. You need to nuance this, because all men, men as a group, they, they are, their mental health literacy is really poor, their access to health services, they just don't go there. We're not very good sometimes about eating well, we're more likely to be smoking, we're also doing drinking drugs quite a bit more, more likely to express ourselves in sometimes violent and aggressive ways, we're more likely to commit suicide, more likely to be imprisoned as a group, and we're probably more like, we're definitely more likely to die younger. That's not men have been sexually abused, that's men as a group. So you're starting from a kind of almost deficit model about that. That's not to say, that we were born this way. It's about how do we then respond to that. As well as there's many similarities for men and women in the response to, to sexual violence. And we, but we, for example, depression features a lot for survivors. But the context of gender and how depression might be experienced is different. Okay, so I put a basic thing about service delivery up here. Um, and you know, that you can draw, and this is very similar for women's experiences as well. Um, but I guess one of the things is when you go to a sexual assault as a male and you find the only poster is a DV poster, a domestic violence poster, which names men as the perpetrators of domestic violence, then they're thinking, this isn't the service for me. Or if they say, and this is, you know, this happens in, in uh, Australia, that people say, oh no, sorry, we don't have men come into our service. Or you can only come in on a Tuesday afternoon between 2 and 4 p.m. Um, so I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is we need to respond to men in, in the ways that are going to be supportive to them. And sometimes it's not about going to services, but it's about doing outreach. It's about having friendly receptions. It's about recognising that men different from women actually might, do prefer a choice between a male and a female counsellor. In fact, about 60% of them would prefer a female counsellor. That doesn't mean they'd always want to have a male, they, they always want to have a female counsellor, but often they'll understand, well, this woman might understand this more. Or it was a male I was sexually abused by. And you're asking me to go into a counselling room with another male to talk about this highly charged issue where I'm feeling nervous and anxiety and overwhelmed, and with another male around this. And I've got trust issues with males around that. So we need to make sure we, we change and we have diverse responses and choices for the men in, in, in this. We need to also recognise you know, things like evening appointments. 
some people just don't do that. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, I'm going to say, excuse me, uh, I'd just like to go for my counselling session at 2pm in the afternoon. Uh, we can say, yes, men should be able to do that, yes, but the reality is men won't do that. And don't ask me what my counselling session is going to be about, because I'm not going to tell you that anyway. So it's about recognising that we need to respond to men in all their diversity and with the needs that they have. We also need to remember, you can't expect men to, res to present neatly. Anybody, you can't expect anybody who's experienced sexual violence, violation to present in a neat way. Some, some services or some of our, our helpline uh, ask the question, well, uh, if, before I'm going to provide you with the service, can you tell me whether you've been involved in any violence? We just lost half the group of men around this, around this issue. You've got to present like you've already got together before you're going to come in the door. Don't come in the door. Uh, it's like saying you can't come in the door if you've had a drink. Well, yes, you could say that, but, you, but it's much more nuanced would be where, you, where you're in a sense sober enough to have us have a conversation and to support you and refer you on or to do work with you. So you've got to be careful about that, but you cannot forget engagement. It is no good setting up a service or sitting in a service and expecting the guys to come through the door. Yes? And engagement, anybody who does counselling should know engagement is part of your job every single day you're working with somebody. Do not expect, because you've been chatting with him for six months, that you cannot attend to and invite him into this space as a useful working space for him. Okay, um, in, in Australia, and we're starting to see a shift around the world around this trauma-informed care and practice. It is excellent. What that's saying is all services who work in the mental health, the physical health, and in the rec recommendations of the Royal Commission, uh, all the police need to be trauma-informed. That's what we're seeing getting rolled out uh, around that. And it's about rec creating a safe, supportive environment. Of course, we need to check in what is safe for some guys. We need to provide individual choice and self-determination. We need to already understand triggers, not wait for him to tell you. You need to be sensitive what the triggers might be. We need to in, in already present resources. So you don't have to come through the door, but we are distributing and sharing resources at all opportunities for you to better manage the experience of trauma. We need to talk with an empowering and strength-based approach, and we need to be collaborative and respectful. But what I'd say around this is you've got to be careful we don't just therapise ourselves here around an experience of sexual violation. The reality is that this is a, an assault that took place, and people want justice. Let's not forget a crime has been committed. And let's not just work all of that stuff around just around therapy stuff, but think about the experience of justice and improving our criminal justice system. Royal Commission's just produced 85 recommendations about a significant change to our criminal justice system. Um, because at this moment in time, and I've been through a few trials, I was an ex-police officer, but also just sitting with men in the last few months in, in court. At the moment, it is a place of further traumatization and abuse. And this is in a world where we're trying to operate really, really well. To step into that world, is, is, it takes so much resilience, so much strength, where you are isolated and you are um, continue your questions around your abuse. We have to get better systems. We need opportunities for civil litigation around this stuff. And we know that other open forms of justice as well that people want to engage in, and to speaking with people who will listen to them and improve the service responses who are in positions of power and authority. And that's a recognition that restitution and compensation form a critical part of the response. Okay, so I've just put um, the diversity thing up here. I've just, you know, there, there is no generic man. And what we know is some men are at greater risk. You know, you just start, men with a disability. We know that men with an intellectual learning disability, but somewhere at least, at least 60 to 70 percent of them would have experienced childhood sexual abuse. There's one study in Brisbane, it's 93 percent. It's better to presume they've experienced childhood sexual abuse than to not presume. We know men who are deaf or hard of hearing, 50 percent report childhood sexual abuse. And that's the same figure for females, 50 percent. We know that people present with mental illness much more likely. We know that First Nations men and women, in a sense, are much more likely to experience childhood sexual abuse. Now, uh, my colleague uh, Anthony Newcastle is speaking tomorrow, so I'm not going to speak about First Nations uh, responses. There's a little bit I'll talk about later on, but that's important. We need to recognise that developing culturally linguistic diverse material and resources are a part of this. 
we need to respond to men in prison, you are much more likely to experience sexual assault in prison. And that's what we found with the Royal Commission. We'll talk about that as well. Conflict, post-conflict zones, specialist responses, those in rural region, you just can't expect them to come into a counselling. It's not going to happen. You've got to recognise that young men, male sex workers, need special support around this, particular, which is targeted to them, where they live, they work. And we also need to reckon, recognise transgender people. We can't do this binary men, women thing. It just doesn't work. Transgender people are much more likely to be sexually assaulted than straight women. Around 50% of transgender people report sexual violence. At our service, where we work with men, that's, that's predominantly how we see We see we've got about currently four transgender people we're seeing, both male to female and female to male. It's because sometimes they, they feel better coming to our services, the male identifying service, than they do to the female service, because they're, they're in a world where it's not certain, according to some people's categories, about where they are. So we need to improve our response and not get caught with this thing because you'll miss transgender people who are most likely to be sexually violated. And I think really in the context of being at a crossroads of how we respond at a community and political level is that making it possible for men from diverse groups to come forward but also having those mechanisms that don't have a time limit. There needs to be an ongoing recognition that because we know there can be delayed disclosure that men's ways of talking and speaking about this issue needs to be put in the, the context of policy responses. Right, hopefully we've got a video next, which would be lovely, um, if we can play it. Now, one of the things about this video is I developed it, and this is, I should put a little introduction to this. This was developed, I uh, worked with, with Anthony Newcastle and the Didgery Group, which is a group of indigenous men who play, um, whose, whose role is to, um, in a sense, that they join together around playing the didgeridoo. Um, but these men wanted to speak to their community. They recognised how important it was to share their voices to support people that experience abuse. And they did something in our video, it's, it's like a minute, it's two minutes, and there's one minute and then a second, where they want to speak to the barriers to disclosure, which many of us know, but also within community. But then also they wanted to offer encouragement and hope to other community members. They didn't want to stop there. So that's a kind of problematic way of operating. So hopefully we'll be able to play this video. Let's get serious about helping men who have been sexually abused in childhood. No more. Why didn't he fight back? No more. Where's the proof? No more. Why didn't he tell someone? No more. He's making it up. No more. It's in the past. And no more. Just get over it. No more. Just made it up. No more. It's a woman's issue. No more. What kind of man would let that happen to him? No more. It's none of my business. No more. We don't talk about that. No more. Not in our family. Rape is a crime. Institutions. No more denial. No more of this. It's cultural. No more shame job. We've got to talk about this. No more. It's none of my business. No more excuses. No more excuses, no more violence. No more silence. No more. If you are a man who has been sexually abused, we want to say to you... You're not responsible for what happened to you as a child. You're not alone. We care. No more being alone. There are people out there for you. I'm sorry it happened to you. You don't have to be defined by what happened to you. The blame is not yours to carry. The shame isn't yours to carry. No more feeling ashamed. No more feeling guilty. Find someone to talk to. You're our brother. Let's get the help you deserve. Take care of yourself. You're worth it. It's never too late to start healing. It's never too late to start healing. OK, that's two minutes. Just two minutes. In a sense of getting the message. And what was interesting was, and, and that's, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but the reality is it's about creating things that people will share amongst their own community. It's not about us always doing things, but let's start creating things which people can use themselves and find useful. 
Uh, and one of the great things is that the men have not stopped there. We now have another video, which Anthony will show tomorrow, where they're, where they're saying some other stuff around this, about supporting community members, about how best to respond. Um, groups for men. It's, you know, Ken talked about, really this started with a group for, for Ken. And what we know is that groups are a really valuable uh, tool that men really appreciate. One of the guys said to me, look, it's five times harder to go into the group but after week three or four, it's actually five times better for me. It's so much more. I no longer feel isolated. I no longer feel it's me to blame. We, we at our service also run group for partners because often partners feeling isolated around this stuff and other community members. So that's another information support for them. There's different models. There's a phase model, a drop-in group, an ongoing model. Uh, and it's recognizing that you need to consider this. It's not a one-off thing. I'm sorry, one-off weekends do not deliver in long-term change. Supported by other uh, counseling, that's good, but you do need to make sure that you have multiple opportunities for people to dip in, dip out, but also have the ongoing group for people. As a group, uh, Wednesday before last, one of the guys came in, he hadn't been back for 15 months and he chose to come back. For him, it was really, really important to do that. And, and he previously, he'd come back after 12 months when he hadn't spoken. He wanted to come back this time to say, thank you, you saved my life on that day 15 months ago and coming to this group, because I knew when I see that message every month, there's somebody there for me. And I want to come back to say thank you to you, because I'm actually doing a lot better in my life. And so that was important for the men to hear in that group. Um, what you also will know, and he says online now, I'll put this, I've done some work with um, the uh, Men and Healing, which was um, the men's, uh, men's project in Ottawa, and we've now, uh, we've shared our group model. Yeah, we've shared it, it's online, there's 250 pages. It's got your intake, it's got your model, it's got each session of Unite, it's got all your information handbook, it's whatever you want, it's free. We're not doing it necessarily to say this is the model, but let's just start putting some information out there, sharing those resources and using those uh, resources so other people can develop those in, in a way. It should be free, this kind of information. It shouldn't be paying for, and it should be easy accessible to everybody. Okay. Uh, counselling. Um, look, we've both done counselling. We're both counsellors. I teach counsellors. Um, I think it's really, really important that we have counselling opportunities. What we've got to be careful of is we don't prioritise face-to-face. For some guys, telephone counselling. Because they can't get face-to-face, they're never going to get face-to-face. That's an important... And if this is talking about a therapeutic therapy counselling, where you'll book in and you'll do some work. Online, I know one in six doing some online, and they're getting sign-up. And what will happen is people will cut to the chase really quickly on the online. But for some of these guys, the, the voice thing, they can't even speak, but they can type. So we can't create models where the only thing you can do is to come into the counselling session and meet the counsellor. That's not going to happen. We need to be aware of having developing a kind of alliance with, with others, others when we're doing this. Our relationship, as we've heard earlier, is important. We know that trauma-informed work and the three-phase model is important, but we know also phase two, for some guys, is really important. Phase two, for some guys, they don't need it. They've worked it out after phase one. Some guys will only ever come into phase one. So we've got to be careful we don't set up this thing, you have to go through this whole thing. Because for some men, this isn't, this, their well-being isn't tied to that. The partner thing is important. Because different from women, what we know around the research is men often do not have a long-term confidant, or do not have a group of friends that they've grown up that they may share this information with, which <laughs> women do. When that is a reality for them and they're struggling in their relationships, the person they're most likely to tell is their partner. That's all the research would say, disclosure is the partner. And then, what's the next thing they say to them? Don't tell anybody. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So then she's cut off, or he's cut off, from all their support structures around this. So we have to, our service, over 20% of it is partners. Some partners come without their men. They're saying, I want to be the best partner I can and support him in this process. I'm struggling with this. But... He won't come at this moment in time. So we need to make sure that the partners are properly supported, that they're not further isolated around that. And that's particular around working with men when you're doing that work with men around. Okay. Um, we've also got to recognise the advocacy role. Now, in a sense, everybody who's spoken here today is, is about advocacy. And it's not just about advocacy at an individual level. Um, it's advocacy, sometimes groups. So there's some people we work with where there's a particular institution that they were abused in. So we work as a, a to group that, that group of men and support them in making change and having acknowledgement in that institution. We need to recognise that in a sense also that nobody's going to come to counselling. If you haven't got anywhere to sleep, you've got no money, you've got no way of accessing any transport. 
So we don't, can't set this bar to come into this place when you don't have anything. So that case management and additional support around that, and I'm sorry, if there isn't a moment of fixed here, there'll be people when dipped in and they'll need extra work. And often they don't want separate people doing that. They'll want a counsellor advocate who knows and is going to support them in this role. And that's important with the research. And, and it's, that's very critical in the order of services. I know experience not only at Living Well and survivors and mates Samson in Sydney have found setting up those uh, support mechanisms before therapy or group starts is really critical. And that's what the man is often asking. I need to sort out things with, with uh, social security, with health, with my lawyer. So providing with practical resources to assist them gets that sense of competency, sense of self-reliance. Now, if you, and a guy's got a sense of self-reliance, I'm much more able to deal with some of this horror that happened to me. But if you haven't got that, if you're always feeling unsettled, then how could you ever do counselling? It's really just an impossible task. Okay, so look, I, I'm not saying that our services is the kind of one to go to for this or anything like that. But my, my attitude here is that we need to make things free and available. So uh, it's about also not just naming. These are some of the common problems that people who have experienced sexual violence have. You need to provide practical things that they can do when they're experiencing depression when you name it. So when we wrote the handbook for, for working with guys, every time we named a challenge around sexuality, we'd have some questions and thoughts about how you might take care of yourselves, understand this problem, and deal with it. It's, it's, it's like a, it's, it, you're not going to name things and trigger people off if you haven't also provided in your naming some additional support that you could uh, around that. I've just, as well as the uh, foundations group, I've got four, uh, ten modules up there so far about working with males who have been sexually abused. It's a kind of a uh, joint project with uh, Survivors Manchester, with a uh, one in six, and with Griffith University. It is free. Please use it. The reason why I did that is there is no excuse for mainstream services to say anymore, we don't know what to do. If you, somebody has experienced such horror, and we now know about this, then how can you as a service, in knowing this habit, to not also have thought through the solutions for that and access the information? And it's not about, oh, I need to go see this specialist counselling. We need to disseminate that knowledge at every opportunity. It's about also about community capacity building. Now, I've got a, one more video around this. But it's also in addressing the barriers, the myth. It's about using social media. It's really good for disseminating information. We recognise online, 3 a.m. in the morning when I can't sleep and I'm having di difficult thoughts, nightmares, I want practical solutions that I can access and sometimes I can't even phone someone. We need to make sure all that kind of information is available to people. We need to make sure that the uh, videos or material we produce uh, resonate with the guys, but also, and this is key, that we, acknowledging the horror, also include hope. It's almost like if I'm going to do a presentation and, you know, amongst this audience, I, if I just stopped with giving you all the horror and the, the impacts of sexual abuse and I stopped there, that is the most depressing thing that you can do. You have a responsibility to make sure you also share and provide people with information about how they can look after themselves or where they can access that sort of material. So our responsibility, even in creating small pieces like we did just there, is to not just have the story of horror, but also to have a part of that about hope. Because that's what guys are talking about. They're saying, we want this information. We, we don't want all these depressing media stories. Now, I'm going to show a video, a uh, two minute bit video, from a man um, who we've worked with. Uh, he was in a particular institution in Queensland, which uh, actually identified by the Royal Commission by the worst institution in the whole of the country. Um, he is going to uh, speak directly to you. He, he's chosen to get on board with the One, One Blue String project. I'll let him speak to that. I'm not saying you need to take it up, but think about mediums that you can use. I should invite you in watching that to be grounded here in the present. He is not going to give you details of what happened to him, but he's going to talk directly to you. And it's also important for him to have the bit at the end around hopeful, being hopeful around this. So it's a two minute video. G'day, I'm Mal. Thanks for uh, expressing your interest in getting on board with One Blue String. This campaign invites guitarists to replace one string with a blue string to help promote awareness for male survivors of sexual abuse. I am one of those one in six men that was sexually abused in childhood. Why does One Blue String resonate with me? 
It has given me the courage and strength to do something I've always wanted to do, play the guitar. It has helped me to express myself and stand up and be heard. Sexual abuse is a betrayal of trust. It is isolating and makes you doubt yourself. At a young age, I become a ward of the state when my father shot and killed my mother. I was eight years old. In the boys' home, I gravitated to music, mainly the band, because I thought that's what I want to do. It helped to transport me and to dream of a better life. This dream turned into a nightmare when my music teacher started abusing me. What he did to me haunted me for decades. I was left as my fault. The sexual abuse disconnected me from myself and from my love of music. Now over 30 years later, I'm learning to reconnect and trust again. Picking up a guitar and playing music has helped me to heal. It has taught me discipline and self-compassion and that it's okay to make mistakes. Today I am playing and putting myself out there again. Why? Because I can and it feels great. I still struggle with self-image, but with practice, will maybe one day shine through. So thank you for listening to my story and choosing to get on board with one blue string. Awareness, advocacy and support is what one blue string is and I love it. It's a postscript. The reason why I couldn't release this until about what, two months ago. It was filmed five months ago. For Mao, it wasn't about the sentence, it was about validation and acknowledgement. It was as hard as the experience of sexual abuse for him to go through that. And the reason why that head sentence was eight years, because he faced the court and said, I will not take a lesser sentence, we cannot plea bargain on this. If he had not gone to court, it would have been, four years would have been the maximum sentence around this issue. It should not be that hard. We all have a responsibility to make it easier for people to come forward and to support them. And we need to do it in a way which is not about symptom management, yes? Not about just coping. It's about creating lives and supporting people to live rich and full lives as people who have experienced abuse can. It's not a simplistic recovery model. It's about building hope, where as a community, we understand and we support and we care for each other. Thank you very much. So it's particularly important we, we go away and enjoy tonight and take good care of ourselves. Self-care is a really critical part. So thanks for listening to our presentation. Thank you.